Welcome everyone. Welcome to the Open Simon webinar series. Uh, first, I want to make sure that um, the folks on the line can hear me. So if you can either um, type in the chat or tell me, come off mute. Oh, great. Thanks, Donna. Awesome. Thank you, Vasu. So, uh, like I said, welcome to the Open Simon webinar series. For those who may be new to Open Simon, it is a learning engineering community working to improve uh, learning outcomes for all. And this series is meant to provide information, examples, demonstrations of learning engineering techniques and tools, and to celebrate best practices in applied uh, learning science. Today, we have uh, Peter Schaldenbrand, um, a developer on the LearnSphere project who regularly her holds um, user workshops. And we have Ken Katinger again with us, um, who is a the Hillman professor at Human Computer Interaction and in Psychology. He's the director of Learn Lab and LearnSphere and the director of the Metals program here at CMU. So I'm going to uh, start out a little differently this time. We're gonna play a video for you. Uh, Peter put together a, a nice video um, that walks us through uh, an example in LearnSphere um, and we'll dive right in. But first I want to uh, take a poll to find out how many of you are familiar with LearnSphere. So give me a moment as I put that poll up. So the poll really is simple. It's how familiar are you with using LearnSphere and you're either completely new at the top or you've explored the tool a little bit or you use it all of the time. Uh, so let us know. Uh, I use it regularly, it's just me. <laughs> Ken. <laughs> Skewing the results. Yeah. Um, that's great. Okay, it looks like most folks are new or have explored a little bit. So I'm glad you've, you've come to the workshop to find out more about it. So let me end the poll. And then Peter, would you uh, mind maybe just giving us a little introduction to the video that we're going to show? Yeah, so I'm going to introduce some of the gradebook abilities and tools that we have in Tigris. There are lots of different things you can do in Tigris, obviously, but I'll introduce maybe the three components that you'll use mainly when dealing with gradebook data. So we'll import some, and then we're gonna look at some correlations between the different uh, assessments in that gradebook. And so what you're looking for in the correlation matrix is gonna be um, looking for some parts of the course that are highly correlated with the final. And so a high correlation is gonna mean that students who do well in one do well in the other, and students who do poorly in one do poorly in the other. So it's a measure of association. We're also gonna look at the Cronbach's alpha score of the items in a gradebook. And that's basically gonna show the relation of the items to the rest of the items in the group. Yeah, thanks Peter. Um, so I think you gave us a nice little primer into what we need in the video, need to know for the video. So give me a moment folks as I uh, create, you know, stop sharing the slideshow and get to the video. So. Can everyone see uh, that I have a video ready to go on my screen? Yep, okay, great. So give us a few minutes and listen. In this video, we illustrate how you can use gradebook data and quiz performance data to test the efficacy of pieces of course content and generate ideas for course improvement. In particular, we will answer these three questions. How can you use course data in the previous semester to improve your course in the next semester? How can I determine which parts of my course are strongly associated with student success or failure? Which questions provide the best opportunity for improvement, meaning empirically shown to be difficult but still reliable. I'm going to use LearnSphere's Tigris workflow tool and gradebook data to identify an assignment that seems to be worth investigating in order to potentially improve that assignment and improve the course. The course gradebook that I'm going to use is the course gradebook from Psychology MOOC. It is a tab delimited file and I'll show it here in Excel first. Most learning management systems are able to export to Excel or tab delimited 
Ask your technical support person for help getting the grading data into the correct tab delimited format. This is an example of what your exported gradebook data might look like. The first column here is student identifier. The top row is the different assessments, including quizzes, a few extra credit written assignments, a midterm, and a final exam. The last column is a final grade, which is some weighted composite of the other scores. So the top row is variables. The first column is students. The following columns are assessments, and the last column is a summary score. The last column is optional, though. If you don't have a final grade, it can be computed for you, and I'll show that later. Now we're going to use Tigris to analyze this data. You can get to Tigris from LearnSphere.org like this by clicking the Get Started button, or you can go directly to this URL above. Once you log in or create an account, you will get to the workflow homepage. This is where you'll see your own workflows, and you also have access to other people's workflows if they've marked them to be public. We're going to create a new workflow. The list of various components in Tagarius is found on the left here. We're going to start a workflow as most others start, just by importing some data. So I'll drag the import component into the workflow, then hit the gear icon to open its settings. I'm going to upload the file from my own computer. Then I'll select the file and upload it. Before running the workflow, though, I'm going to go back into that component list. And under analysis, I'm going to drag the correlation component. I'll connect the gradebook data to the correlation component by dragging from the output node of the import to the input node of the correlation component connecting them. With all new components, it is important to click on the gear to see what kind of settings need to be set or modified. This gradebook already has a summary column, so I'll set this to be true. If the gradebook doesn't have a summary column, or a final grade as the last column, then select false. I'll click the Save and Run button to get the results of the correlation component. To view the results, I can either double click on the output node, or I can click on this magnifying glass. Now, if your gradebook data uh, didn't have a summary column as the last column, it'll be computed here down at the bottom. In this correlation matrix, we find the answer to question two. I can see how well each assessment correlates with the final grade in this bottom row, as well as how the assessments correlate with each other throughout this matrix. We notice that the green highlighted cells are particularly high correlations, while the reds are low. The thresholds for these are found at the top. One interesting pattern is that quizzes leading up to the midterm have very high correlation with it, as you'd expect. What we're interested in in this video is which module or assessment is most predictive of the final grade. We see that a few quizzes are highly correlated with the final grade. Interestingly, the midterm is more correlated with the final grade than the final exam is. This cell suggests that students who do well in quiz nine do well in the class, and students who do poorly on quiz nine do not do well in the class. So is there something about quiz nine and the module associated with it that we can consider improving? I have data from these items in quiz nine so now I'll import it into this workflow and investigate further. I'll import my data from quiz nine, just as I did with the class grade book. I'll then go into the component list and drag out an assessment component. I'll connect this to my quiz data and make sure I've set the settings correctly. Then I'll run the workflow. The assessment component computes reliability values for the items, a measure of the expected correlation of two items that measure the same construct along with some other useful statistics about the items. Once the workflow is finished running, we can look at the file that has been imported by double clicking on the output node. The first column is the student identifier, and the last column is the total score for each student on quiz nine. There are columns for each of the questions or items, with a one indicating that the student got the question correct. Let's look at the results of the assessment component by clicking on the magnifying glass. What this table will show you is, since that 
the overall quiz is reasonably reliable with a Cronbach's alpha of 0.74. The exclusion analysis below suggests that all of the items are, at least from a psychometrics point of view, contributing to the reliability such that if we take any one question out, the overall reliability doesn't go up. All of these questions are reasonably reliable. So now to answer our third question, we will look at the average column. Question three and question seven both have very low averages compared to the other questions. This suggests that these questions are more difficult, but still reliable because of that Cronbach's alpha score. This suggests that the question contains concepts, skills, knowledge components that students need to grasp to be successful in this course. Using a method of identifying which modules of your course are strongly associated with success, then drilling down into the individual items of this module, you can use data to drive improvements to your course using LearnSphere. Great. So that, um, I'm wondering, I didn't see any questions pop up in the chat. So we're going to take a moment now before we move on to another example uh, with Ken to uh, find out if you guys have any questions about what you just saw. Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> you can even just, you can even come off mute. Yeah, actually, pretty small group. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to turn this over now to Ken, who's going to go through another uh, example and demonstration. <clears throat> so let me make sure I stop sharing. Oh, yeah. Because I can't share. Right. Give me a moment. There we go. You should be set. Yeah, I'm going to share my whole desktop. Um, and, um, so I made a new workflow by uh, going to Peter's and uh, uh, saving it, and then uh, and then modifying it. So um, you'll see uh, up at the top here uh, this there's this import um, thing, and then like I when I imported and looked at my data. Um, uh, and by the way, this is data that's coming from uh, some open learning initiative materials that I have. If I flip to this other screen, maybe I'll show you the context of the data. So I have uh, here in uh, Canvas uh, my e-learning design course, and here's the syllabus and, and schedule and, and activities and assignments and so forth. But I can go from that to, to the OLI course materials here. Um, and the OLI uh, dashboard and gradebook and so forth, but here's the course materials. Um, and uh, those involve uh, like these slide decks and there's inline assess formative assessment materials, uh, some multiple choice, some of these menu-based ones, they're sometimes drag and drop. Um, when students get to the end of a particular module, um, a couple pages later here, they have this quiz that they can take um, as many times as they want. Oh, I guess no more than a thousand, there's a maximum. <laughs> um, and the idea is I, I assign this before class so that they come to class uh, prepared, for example, uh, with module five uh, to, uh, to talk about why data toward goal setting improves design um, and some introductions to one, uh, one a couple of uh, cognitive task analysis and contextual inquiry methods. Um, so we're looking at the gradebook data from that course. If I jump back to the LearnSphere window here, oops. Um, so when I imported that uh, gradebook, uh, which I, you know, I downloaded from Canvas and, and I brought in here, um, I noticed that there was a, a bunch of extra columns that uh, that weren't, uh, uh, that I didn't need to have. Um, and, and you can see, this is actually from a, a summer version of the course where I, uh, online version, I only had, I guess, 14 students in it. So this is a small sample. Um, but I wanted to remove some of those columns. So that's why I dragged in this column remover uh, transform component here. 
Um, and as Peter indicated earlier, you can you know set, indicate which columns you want to move here, remove. So I removed the selected ones, and then I went to those two components that he mentioned earlier. And what we can see uh, here is the um, for each of those modules in OLI and my examples assignments, my client-centered project final deliverable, my, my self-directed final project report and reflection and so forth, um, what the uh, reliabilities are for treating each of those assessments essentially um, as an assessment of the overall course score. So actually pretty high reliability across the, all, all of those items. And you see that the correlation of individual modules with that final score tends to be reasonably high. Um, you also see that the average performance on these uh, module quizzes is pretty high too. That's because, as I said, they're allowed to take it as many times as they want. I really mean it as a formative assessment. Oh, and I should have mentioned that we have a reasonable pool of items. So each time they take that quiz, they're getting a random subset of items associated with the learning objectives. So it's not exactly the same quiz, but it is on the same learning objectives. But yeah, as you can see, those, those numbers get up to be pretty high. Um, if I were to do this more again, I might seek to get the data on the first quiz performance to see how that uh, correlates. But um, you do see that module five here is one of the highest correlations at six, at 0.67. So as Peter said, that might suggest to me that if I want to improve learning in this course, maybe there's an opportunity to look at uh, module five and see where the students who, you know, in this correlation, there's some who are doing well on this module and well in my course, but there's also others who are doing not so well on this module who are doing not so well in my course. So if I can figure out what they're struggling with, then maybe I can improve that. Um, so then what I did is I went back and uh, um, with a little help from uh, uh, Data Shop and the Sample Builder, I guess we talked about Data Shop last time, but this, this data set um, for my courses is, is here in this, uh, I guess this was the fall of 2018, um, is here and I was able to create a sample in Data Shop that's just that module five. Then I exported that from, from Data Shop, brought it back into LearnSphere. Um, and uh, yeah, it turns out it's in a tall format in Data Shop, if we look here, where every row in this table is, uh, um, is a different student um, assessment question combination. So it's really, really big, lots of rows per student. And what I want for this component is, is a wide version where there's only one row per student and the columns are the different items uh, or different assessment uh, questions they experienced. Uh, so in LearnSphere, I used this pivot table component, um, which allows me, if you know pivot tables in Excel, to essentially create, oops, from that, uh, uh, you don't need to see the chat, you can see. Create from that tall table a wide table where the columns are going to be um, in data shop. Uh, step name is essentially the assessment item that we have data on. Some problems or some questions might have multiple sub steps to them, each one of which we get a data point. So we want each of those steps for which we have data on students as the columns. And uh, the rows, if we were to scroll here, are going to be the uh, the anonymous student ID, and then the cells are uh, their uh, correctness on this problem, and we're taking a mean correctness of that. And th that table comes out here, and uh, it turns out I discovered that that table um, has these NAs in it um, that are assessment component. Oops, got too many. Uh, Excel files open here. Our success assessment component, at least last week when I did this, didn't like those NAs. Mm -hmm. So I deleted them in Excel. <laughs> uh, and then I went back to LearnSphere and reloaded that table down here. Ideally, and, and I think 
we might already have this fixed such that this assessment component will ignore the NAs, but um, one of the cool things about LearnSphere is uh, these components can all be upgraded at any moment. So if we find a little glitch or a way to improve it, we, we can do that. But uh, when I did this uh, last week, um, I did that, you know, I did this step by hand, right? And then loaded the new table. And now this import has the NAs gone. And now I can go look at what the assessment component results produced. And when I look at that, um, I can see, yeah, all these OLI names for assessment questions are pretty, pretty long and a little bit tricky. But um, yeah, the Chromebox Alpha isn't as high here. I think partly because, again, the performance tends to be so high in general because this mm -hmm. is um, their repeating uh, performance over time. Uh, but I did notice um, that actually maybe some of these questions aren't as uh, aren't so reliable. They don't have a great correlation to the total score, and I might want to go look at those. Some do. Um, and uh, let's see, there was one that I was looking at that I guess it's uh, I was looking at this one here. So if I go back to to uh, data shop. Um, I can find that particular question. And at this point, maybe I'll try to make these two. That's why I shared my whole screen so I could do this side by side. Um, I can uh, look at this one here that's got a pretty good, uh, it, it is reasonably reliable because it's, uh, it's correlated with the overall test, but the performance on this item is not so hot. Uh, so that is a kind of hard item. So what is that item? Uh, that's that's this one. Um, and uh, I can see here that the correct answer was theory, but some students pick, a lot of students pick data, some picked assessment test design, uh, some picked models and insight. So uh, what was that question? Um, in data shop, I can navigate to find the question and it was, uh, um, there's an image of the big picture diagram, which would be showing in the actual course, um, but we don't see it here. I think I have, that's in my course, this is the big picture of e-learning design. Um, and there, in this question, they're supposed to say, the first step in Clark's structured interview cognitive task analysis, CTA, is to collect preliminary knowledge. Which component of the instructional design process represented above in the big picture diagram is aligned with this step? And the correct answer is, is theory, because um, they're essentially going to the literature and seeing what existing theory is. We saw a lot of students click data, maybe because they're interpreting preliminary knowledge as such. But yeah, just to, just to give you a sense that, you know, in the, in the slides here, when they are reading about this, um, uh, um, I guess I showed you this and I meant to be, is it a different slide deck? Yeah, I meant to be in the next page. Um, uh, here's the steps in a structured interview described by Clark and this is collecting preliminary knowledge and you know, this is, and this is an illustration of it here and and so forth. So, um, yeah, and you can see actually here's, is that this item? Use the image to answer the next five questions. Map the steps of Clark's structure to your, yeah, this is actually the, the item we're looking at. Um, I think this is, yeah, so you can see uh, that if I click that, I get positive feedback, right? So, uh, yeah. That's as far as I got so far. Mm. <laughs> I don't know what I should do to make my course better in this regard, but, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, you know, and, I, and like I said, I can go look at some of these other items to get a sense for like, yeah, why is this one not so well correlated? Um, uh, um, and, you know, maybe it's, maybe the writing of it's unclear. Um, I think in this particular case, as I'm thinking out loud about it, um, this, uh, learning 
these new uh, interview, structured interview processes is still kind of unfamiliar to students and, and then maybe didn't think very deeply about what collecting preliminary knowledge is. So I could make sure to emphasize that more in class kind of thing. Yeah. So, uh, well, I hope that gives you an idea. And, and a part of what I wanted to show is like, you know, whereas the example Peter put together, we had done as an illustration of how it might work. Um, this is meant to show like how a real instructor might actually stumble a little bit as I did <laughs> through this, but, but be able to use the, what is available both in LearnSphere and DataShop uh, to make some pretty good progress. I spent, I think I spent, I don't know, maybe 30, 45 minutes on this. Um, granted, I know data yeah. shop and that's <laughs> pretty well, right. but, but if you do know it pretty well, it's a pretty fast turnaround. Yeah, I have to admit, as I was even um, learning it, as I was doing the RISE framework um, demonstration, it was pretty intuitive and, and easy to use. And there's a lot of good documentation in the tool to help you through it. So thanks, Ken, that was a great example. And just to really summarize, um, we looked at uh, a couple of different things in LearnSphere. We, we looked at manipulating the formatting of some of the data. So if you have a data set that doesn't quite, um, is, is quite in the format that the particular component, import component needs, you can use other components, other transform components to uh, get that data in the right format. Um, you analyzed performance across an entire course, looking for places where students are, are stumbling or, or having difficulty or performing well on particular um, parts of the course and how that contributes to the overall uh, grade and, and outcome mastery. Um, and then you drilled in to a specific quiz and set of questions to see what questions uh, might be contributing to um, that good or or poor performance in the course. And, you know, I think that's something that's really, uh, that would be really useful to any instructors that have, you know, a set of gradebook data, really, which most, most do. So uh, let me turn it back to you folks. And, and do you have any questions based on what you saw today or even specific things that, that you're working on um, that you were trying to kind of grasp how you might uh, do uh, something similar in LearnSphere. No questions. Well, let me ask you this. Um, what, what barriers do you think you have to uh, doing this sort of thing? Oh, we have someone with a with a hand up. I didn't see that. I'm gonna come off mute and talk. Or is that a mistake? Kim, do you have a question? <laughs> yeah, it's Kim. <laughs> Hi, Kim. Hi. Sorry. Yeah, I have a question for Ken. Ken, did you? So you have a pre and post on those uh, uh, quizzes. And uh, do you have a pre and post comparison? Is there an easy way to put that into uh, LearnSphere and just look at uh, the pre and post first uh, opportunity um, instead of the cumulative? Yeah, um, well, uh, there is pre and post uh, potential data for each of these modules. Um, it depends on whether this optional pre-quiz at the beginning of each module. So here I am in module five and there's this pre-quiz here. Um, you know, I, I ask students that they do that, but I don't re strictly require it. So um, uh, to be honest, I haven't had a chance to look to see um, if they have complied. But um, I think actually in data shop, I can, uh, look here for example uh and see um that on the pre-quiz the error rate uh was 57 percent basically um and whereas on the later quiz it was 17 and by the way this looks like uh um well, here, let's look at the numbers again. So 13 students did this, uh, did the pre-quiz, if you can see in the rollover. 
I don't know why data shop is that arrow should be pointing to this bar, not up here. <laughs> but, uh, 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 but then, then we have 14 students, uh, you know, so one more, one skipped the pretest here, and there is a lower error rate. I am a little bit, uh, oh, these are unique problems and uh, unique steps. Uh, but I suspect this is averaging over multiple quiz attempts. Um, so the final quiz score isn't easy to extract from here, but I think would, the error rate would be even lower. In fact, I think we saw in my grade book that the error rate on this quiz was, or the success rate, you know, one minus that was, one of these showed that, uh, you know, was in the 90, mm -hmm. yeah, here it is, 96%. So the error rate's down to less than 4%. So yeah, I guess I can sort of do it. I mean, data, we don't have a particular component in LearnSphere for pulling out this information. Although I think if you, if you use the pivot table, the pivot component that we have uh, that I used here, you could probably make a similar kind of table from the data shop, from the same data. That makes me, and I, don't know, I might be getting into trouble here as I'm, I'm digging into the capabilities of these tools, but what um, would it be worthwhile, because you mentioned that you, know, you could have analyzed first attempt on those quizzes, and so could you treat that as kind of pre, pre, pre and post data in a way by analyzing the same quiz data from their first attempt to final attempt or something like that? Yeah, yeah, it, if, if I worked a little bit at it, um, you know, in this, in this student step, I could identify the last time each student did yeah. the quiz and delete all the earlier ones, right? Right, right. Yeah, um, yeah actually, maybe I can just try and, I mean, I, I guess we didn't really illustrate much what it's like to do this live, because I gave you this already baked cake and was showing you <laughs> how tasty it is. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, if I wanted to create a pivot table, you know, where I'm going to compute the, uh, by the way, this might completely bomb. So yeah, bear with fine. me. Yeah. yeah. Live demo. Uh, <laughs> I want to see, what do I want to see? I want to see the mean of the, uh, of the scores on the, um, on a particular problem here. Yeah, there's a lot of extra columns here, but I think I want the problem name uh, in those columns, and one of those will be the pre-quiz, and one of them mm -hmm. will be the, the quiz. And then the measure is, um, I think I want the, uh, is there a correct? I basically want the, the number of corrects, yeah. Um, and so uh, now I need to rerun my uh, workflow. And since this is the only one that's not completed, um, I, it should just run that one component. Hopefully that works. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we can see if I constructed the pivot table correctly. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, there's some, these tables, if they're CSV, they will display right here, Peter, in the window, but if they're tab, they don't. It should. It should? Okay, well, maybe we have a little display bug here, but, uh, yeah, here's that table, and for some reason, I only have the quiz result and not the the pre-quiz result. So, uh, it almost sort of worked. <laughs> uh, yeah, an 82% correct seems similar to what we were seeing in Data Shop, which was a 17% error rate. So that looks right uh, at the moment. Why the quit the pre-quiz didn't 
show up here. I'm a little bit. Did you need to select first attempt as well or no? Only in that uh, measurement in a second. In, in here? No, I, I shouldn't have, although, well, no, what I'm wondering is if it's, yeah, something. The problem name should have multiple values in this table, um, and but it's some, for some reason only displaying one of them. Uh, yeah. Uh, by the way, if I, let me just see what happens if I try a different pivot. Now I'm going to make the rows students and make the columns the problem. And then I'll have to rerun it. Um, Uh, yeah, um, by the way, if you, you know, anybody can log in here and, and if you noticed on the login, there was like different uh, university locations, but you can also log in through Google and you can try this stuff out yourself. Uh, um, and we definitely encourage you to do that. Um, so let's see what it looks like this time. Well, so now, yeah. Uh, I'm now getting each individual student's uh, quiz score here. And these, of course, are anonymized student identifiers, uh, importantly. Um, uh, but at least you get a sense to see how that component works. Um, uh, but I, yeah, Kim, I hope that gave you some sense for the answer to your question. And reassuringly, they are doing better after the instruction than before. <laughs> it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Even if you integrate all their uh, post-instruction quizzes here. Well, that's always reassuring to see, right? <laughs> yep. So what I love about LearnSphere and what's really interesting is this idea of a workflow and how you can set up this workflow to run different um, data sets through. So if you're going to be performing the same analyses on different grade books or different classes, it's all, you know, you, you kind of set it once and you can import different data sets into it and, and do that. You can also do comparisons like right in the same workflow. Um, and the other cool thing is that you can, um, can share these workflows with other folks. So it's really easy for someone else to log in and go to um, these public, uh, publicly available workflows and, and try them out as well. Yeah, down here is the, you can view the code on GitHub. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, I guess I thought, yeah, this is saying that the author is data shop at CMU way was being generous and mm -hmm. <laughs> not attributing it to herself. Uh, but you can actually look at her code. I was scrolling to see if it says how this was implemented. Uh, mm. Because one of the neat things about this is that some of these components were implemented in in the R statistical programming language, some are in Python. What did you implement some of yours in, Peter? PHP, there's MATLAB, C++, uh -huh. uh, JavaScript, Node. Pretty much anything we can wrap up. So if you have code, we can, we can run it. <laughs> cool. Yeah, and so, yeah, you know, uh, in addition to using these things to do practical stuff that I hope we were reasonably illustrating, <laughs> there's also an opportunity to you know, uh, contribute new kinds of analyses or even new combinations of, of these components, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, we have capabilities too, like for the power user to call these workflows uh, through the web so that like if you built a, like you could build a, a one of these adaptive Bayesian knowledge tracing kinds of systems by uh, sending the student data to a, to the Bayesian knowledge tracing, uh, well, to the import component, which would then uh, bring it to the Bayesian knowledge tracing component, and you could get out the parameters that you need to, to run Bayesian knowledge tracing, for example. Uh, so, so yeah, there's good. a lot of yeah. both, a <laughs> lot of existing uh, capabilities, but also 
uh, a lot of potential for interesting growth. Um, right. Yeah. Which is definitely one of the reasons we make this code openly available for sure. I'd be really interested in um, if the folks on the call or in, you know, in the larger community create workflows and um, want to share them out. I was, I was thinking as we were going through this, um, these instructions that I should uh, really look to put something together where we can, we can do that. Maybe some sort of kind of hackathon where we all get in and, and play and see what we can come up with and share. So I know I'll be putting that on my list of ideas for, for future webinars. And you guys can, can write me and tell me how much you'd be interested in something like that. I just brought up another one. This is nice. Illustrates uh, some analysis we did in this paper we called "Learning is Not a Spectator Sport," and uh, um, oh, nice. Peter uh, did a nice job of uh, creating using these. Uh, we have this kind of labeling component, in, uh, so you can. Oh, that's uh, nice. You can add to your workflow some documentation, um, and this is using these causal inference uh, capabilities to try to see if you can get a little extra uh, causal. Uh, uh, information from <coughs> from discovered data like this. In particular, in this analysis, we were trying to see uh, to what extent could we determine um, in a in an online course. It was a MOOC for psychology that used OLI materials. Whether the uh, reading the te online text um, or watching the lecture videos or doing these kind of formative assessment activities, which of these were most causal? with respect to final exam performance. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, is this gonna show the causal graph? Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, this shows that the model says it's the activity started that has this bigger um, effect on the total quiz score, which then has a big effect on the final exam score. And this, this effect is much bigger than playing videos, play refers to hitting play on the video, or going to pages where there are no activities performed. Um, and this, uh, these coefficients are one sec. They're positive, like these are positive things to do to mm -hmm. improve your quiz score, but they're much smaller than uh, that activity started. So yeah, it just shows another example of doing interesting things with, yeah. with Learn. Yeah, and, and by the way, for those of you who might not know, that paper is really easy to find. If you just Google it, it comes right to the top. For the there's a link at the top. Uh, oh, there's next a link. To the save as. Oh, oh, no, right in that there. Eyeball. Uh, a little no, bit no, above no. that. Like up where it says papers. Is that oh, there? here, right. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. I forgot. Yeah. Nice. So if you use a workflow in one of your papers that gets published, you can link it to here. Oh, that's fantastic. Thanks for yeah, letting us know there that. There you go. And there's. And it's a good read too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there's there's essentially that same right model that was reproduced here in LearnSphere. So yeah, we're also trying to encourage people to make the analyses they write up available to others in LearnSphere to, you know. Well, it also sounds like LearnSphere is a good place to create, you know, um, when you have reached some conclusions to show the workflows that you used and, and the results out of LearnSphere you are easily just plugged into a paper too. Um, yeah. Uh. So, yeah, we've showed a lot of examples of what you can do from uh, just even uh, analyzing gradebook data to uh, digging in and, and analyzing you know, individual quiz questions or even doing causal analysis across um, uh, you know, course data, using course data to figure out, um, to answer research questions as well. So, it looks like someone has a hand raised. Go ahead. Is it Vasu? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I was unmute. Oh, uh, okay. Now I unmuted. Yeah. So, uh, so Ken, I had a question. So, uh, uh, looking at the uh, causal map that you just showed about the learning is not a spectator sport, that's very interesting. So, you know, I am interested in, you know, I don't have entire courses on uh, uh, data shop. All I have is just uh, some some CTAD based tutors and the data, uh, my data is on data shop already. So I'm interested in knowing, you know, let's say I make a tutor, 
which consists of uh, say question numbers one, two, three, four, all the way up to 10. And uh, let's say every question consists of several steps, maybe uh, step one, step two, step three, and then final answer. So I was wondering, you know, if can these kind of causal maps be used to ask questions like, hey, uh, which is the bottleneck step in uh, where my students are getting stuck? For example, maybe step number one, my students are uh, breezing through it, but step number two to step number three, let's say my students are struggling. Is it possible to identify such uh, learning gaps based on uh, the data analysis from LearnSphere? Yeah, um, but I, I was just scrolling to a problem to illustrate that, you know, while yeah. some of these things are one step problem, multiple choice problems, uh -huh. this one here is a multiple select, so you, you might select more than one. So it's a sort of a trivial example of multiple steps. Oh. But that, the analysis I was showing was at the, was at the step level. And in particular, um, when I showed these, uh, correlations got so many tabs open am I going to be able to find them uh, it wasn't in that one uh, here um, this was giving us an indication of which of these steps yeah is most in this case um, we're looking at the correlation to the overall module performance. So all the items in this module uh, mm -hmm. are being considered, you know, it's like the modules, like a, you can think of it almost like one big test and which okay. items in it are most associated or most predictive of the total score on the module as a whole. That's not exactly what you asked, but it's similar, right? In the sense. Right. Of, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, that the ones, this Chromebox Alpha thing, like the rea reliability uh -huh. here, is suggestive actually that that's not a very high reliability. And it does suggest that, um, well, it's possible that some of these items are bad. It's also possible with 15 students. And remember, I said there was random selection. I know uh -huh. that you know, uh -huh. some of these items were only seen by two or three students. Uh -huh. So that could just be statistical okay. noise. Um, okay. But if this was a bigger sample uh -huh. and you saw that, the reliability goes up when you get rid of this item. That's what this, this number means. Uh -huh. Consistent with it having a negative correlation with the total score. Uh -huh. That's an indication of one of two things. Uh -huh. Either yeah. it's a bad item or okay. you're really measuring more than one thing and that some students are good at, at one of those two things and not uh -huh. at the other and others are good at the, uh -huh. the, the second but not the first so that like, uh, you mean more than one knowledge components well or that their learning of the knowledge components isn't uniform that that they they're better at learning some of the knowledge components than others whereas where it's the flip for other students oh, it turns okay. out um, th that generally speaking uh, students learning of the knowledge components is pretty well correlated they you know we we can show with learning curve data that they're learning the knowledge components separately, but they're basically, if they've had prior experience in this content, uh -huh. likely to be better at all of the knowledge components um, because of that prior experience. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah, but uh, you could create a workflow uh -huh. that is Actually, a, a simpler version of the one uh -huh. that we were just looking at um, uh, that doesn't that does a regression version of this same analysis uh -huh. is uh, it would use. I think in your case, you could potentially use your. Did you say you had a post test? No, well, not a post. I just had tutor data. Okay. No, a CTAD based tutor. Okay. Yeah. So you could do essentially what I just described then to see uh, yeah. which of the items of steps in your CTAT tutor yeah. um, is most predictive of the overall score, indicating right. that that item is probably pretty, uh, uh, um, essentially pretty good at telling in a single item uh -huh. which students are getting it and which are not. Oh, okay. And then, you know, from a course improvement point of view, it might be one to think about how could you make the instruction better so that everybody's doing well at that step. You know, maybe that's one you need. Maybe often what we found in, if uh -huh. one 
if a particular step stands out, especially if it's harder yeah. uh, than the others. Uh -huh. in, uh, you know, and that's why this average column is useful in this output. Nice. If it's, and that's partly why I picked this one, because it you know, was harder than the other ones. Uh -huh. It might be that there's some hidden skill oh, okay. involved that yeah. you, know, you haven't, that your course isn't very explicitly teaching or that you're not giving enough repeated practice, like that hard thing only happens in that one step and that one problem, so they never get a chance oh, I see. to try it again, to, you know, to show that they can execute that thinking again. Okay. Yeah, it looks like Jeremy and Peter had a little dialogue. Yeah, did, yeah. Did, Jeremy did uh, uh, in the chat. Yeah, in the chat did did that help from? Yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I no, guess good. part of the uh, you do have to have the data in the right format to import it into this component. Uh huh. Uh, Yes. Yeah, but um, yeah, maybe actually we can look at what this data set looks like. It basically involves uh -huh. the different variables here. This is the pretest score, the activities, that's the doing. This is the video watching, the total quiz score, the final exam score, and the readings. And then each row is an individual student. Uh -huh. um, and then Tetrad will take, Tetrad's this causal inference mechanism. Nice. Uh, we'll take those, what is it, six variables, you know, mm -hmm. compute the correlation matrix, and then it's particularly looking at things like, if, if I look at the correlation between pretest and total quiz, which is probably pretty high, mm -hmm. but additional on how many activities a student gets, does the correlation essentially go down because it's the activities done that's accounting for the improvement. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's doing that kind of conditional correlation huh. computation, um, you know, for every triple of variables. <laughs> um, it's a pretty complicated search, but it uses that information then to, to derive this, the, the causal model by essentially being able to you, you notice here that there are certain things that aren't linked, like nothing's linked except for the quiz to the final exam, which right. seems to indicate that the quiz is a mediator. Uh -huh. and any correlation like between how much you do and how well you do on the final exam oh, okay. is essentially erased if you take the quiz into account because the causal story is it's the activities improve your quiz score and uh -huh. uh, by doing well in your quiz and you're better prepared for the final. Mm -hmm. And that makes, it's also partly built into the uh, part of what Tetrad allows you to do. If I can get back to the image. Uh, oh, does this? No. What are you looking for? I want to get back to the workflow. Uh, uh, Can I back up from you, here? Yeah, you probably need to back go, up from here. I yeah. Think. Oh, that was for the sure. paper. Yeah, anyway, there's a component in the, oh, it's this knowledge component. Um, knowledge uh -huh. component, that's a bad use of confusing terminology in the context of our CLE framework. Uh, it, there's this processing component in Tetrad that allows you to say, yeah which variables came first, like the pretest comes before the instruction and the instruction comes between the, before the final. And that helps aid the causal inference a little bit. Of course, if those assumptions are wrong about that ordering. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. You might be fooling yourself a little bit, but that Tetrad is pretty clear about those kinds of. Yeah, and I don't have a Tetrad um, demo on the docket but uh, definitely there's been a lot of interest in it. So I'm gonna, going to try and get it um, a demo next year. Yeah, okay, beginning that'd be of the good. Year. Do we, we do have uh, one of the Learn Sphere videos is about. Yeah, I just extra. linked it in the uh, Oh, fantastic, chat. thanks Peter. Very good. In the, if you go to the help page, huh? 
here, as I'm showing. You, there are other, uh, like I mentioned earlier, Bayesian knowledge tracing. This is one where you can get the Bayesian knowledge tracing parameters. Um, actually, that's that's one thing that you could do with your CTAC tutor if you wanted. Uh -huh. Is uh, you can use data from use of the tutor to fit um, the, the Bayesian knowledge tracing parameters, and then I put them back into CTAC. Uh -huh to guide its problem selection the next time you run it with students. I see, I see, okay. Yeah, is one of these about? There's Tetra. Oh, causal search components in Tigris. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one is, is one. You made this one too, Peter? I think so. Yeah. It's been a while. It's been a while? Yeah, <laughs> it has the old purple in the video. Oh, right. Yeah, you can see a prior. Sense. We're still working on on uh, on LearnSphere and this Tigris workflow. So, feedback well for gum. If it breaks on you, send us an email. Um, I think uh, does the help page has a contact us button. So, do not hesitate to say what. Hey guys, help me out. That's what we're here for. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Ken. Thanks. Yeah, that was great questions. Thanks everyone for being so engaged. Um, looks like we're about to be at the top of the hour. So does anybody have any other questions that they'd like to uh, get in before we, we close for the day? Well, let me see, Ken, you wanna stop sharing so I can oh, yeah, just yeah. get to the link here. So let me, Share my screen again and let you know that um, there's more webinars coming uh, every other week. So the next one's on October 30th. That one is going to be um, back to OLI and demonstrating uh, our chemistry course in um, the Open Learning Initiative <laughs> platform. Uh, we'll have Sandy Razor and Dave Yaron here to talk about um, how they developed the course and other components of the course uh, with you know, um, good design in mind and how uh, OLI supports that and, and ECHO. And CTAT. And CTAT, yeah. I don't know if they're describing that, but I'm I sure know they they, will. they've, they've been used, working on yeah, CTAT yeah. too, so yeah. So uh, definitely. Actually, pretty good illustrations of open Simon ecosystem, right? Yeah. Get multiple tools. Yeah, definitely, yeah. yeah I like to, right. more and more the, um, as we come together, it's almost a natural, um, progression to show what other what other tools connect because you know you, like you've showed today Learn Sphere and Data Shop and how yeah how all those and integrate OLI and OLI right Canvas so right. Uh, yeah. again just illustrating how these tools that we have um, really work together to help you guys uh, figure out what works and what doesn't and and answer some good uh, questions that you have about your instructional designs. So thank you again, everyone. I really appreciate you coming and I hope you can join us at the next webinar on October 30th.